Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Tuesday, April 20th edition of the Basement Academy. Uh, as we get going this morning, I want to remind you uh, just that administrative note about the webinar this coming Sunday evening at 7 p.m. It's on the five wishes. Uh, it's a little booklet that helps one to prepare for end of life, and so it's appropriate for all of us to complete, but also caregivers. Uh, it's a very helpful thing, those who may be in a relationship with someone who themselves may be facing end-of-life decisions. So uh, register at GreenwichPres.org. We'll send you the Zoom link, 7 p.m. Uh, it'll be led by Charlene Beckett uh, and uh, Lucille Marciana, our Director of Congregational Care, and trust that you'll uh, find that to be a helpful and a very thoughtful, thoughtful time. Okay, morning psalm, Psalm 80, one of my favorite psalms. I love the heading on this, for the director of music to the tune of the Lilies of the Covenant. I have no idea what that tune sounds like, but it sounds um, sweet. <laughs> Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty, Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Psalm 80. Context is likely the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem, the great lament that, that came from that. This is a lamenting psalm. It's a pleading psalm. Three times that refrain, uh, restore us, O God Almighty, or, or Lord God Almighty, make your face to shine upon us. It's that blessing that we read uh, in the book of Numbers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. It's that image of God's face, God's presence, God's favor to be upon his people. And so Israel's in a time of, of disfavor. Um, this, this image of the root being planted, Israel like the vine, the root being planted, and then it flourishes, and then all of a sudden the boars from the field are ravaging it and all who pass by pick its grape. It, it's like the, the vineyard that is being destroyed and that is what happened uh, in the exile. And so uh, it seems a, a, an appropriate psalm. I uh, want to continue. This is a, a week of reflection, just sharing some thoughts. And so reflecting on our Sunday night webinar and after yesterday's reflection, did some more reflecting uh, and want to share some of those thoughts uh, with you. Um, 
And so Israel continues uh, this, this challenge of anti-Semitism that we heard Alan, Ronkin, and Sue Stolov uh, speak of. Uh, the, the webinar is posted on the website. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, invite you to uh, spend, it's about an hour and 20 minutes or so. I think it's a pretty thoughtful presentation. And so uh, the, the rise of uh, anti-Semitism, it's, it's happening again in increasing uh, numbers, uh, numbers of attacks, uh, incidents within our own society and, and globally. Uh, there's this concept they talked about, which really intrigued me, and so I did a little more poking around on it. Anti-Semitism as a canary in the coal mine. Now, that, that phrase, canary in the coal mine, is used mostly metaphorically, but it does come, evidently, just kind of poked around yesterday, it comes out of the experience of the miners who go underground and they would take a caged bird. They would have little, saw a picture of a little bird cage that they carry with them. And if there are any dangerous gases, the canary or the bird would, would feel the effects first. And so if the canary keels over, the miners know to get out, okay? So a canary in a coal mine literally was an early detection system. It was an early warning system, kind of like a, a carbon monoxide detector. We have them plugged in upstairs. Um, and so it's, it's a way of warning uh, people when there are adverse conditions that are present. And so this idea that anti-Semitism is a canary in the coal mine for society when anti-Semitism, when people are turning towards the Jews to hate them, to attack them, then that signals something else is coming in society. And so the Jews historically, both we heard this and then just in some of my own supplementary reading, the Jews historically have been targets of conspiracy theories. The notion that the Jews control the banking system, the Jews control Hollywood, that the Jews are somehow uh, behind world events. The Jews have been um, credited with uh, the 9-11 attacks, that somehow that was a Jewish conspiracy, had nothing to do with, it, uh, with um, uh, uh, Islam, right? You know, uh, these Islamic terrorists, that somehow the Jews are behind that, and so on and so on. Where the Jews are demonized, where the Jews are scapegoated, uh, blamed, and targeted. Um, and so I think the idea, as I understand it, as attacks upon Jewish people increase, as, the, as that is tolerated, as that is accepted or even encouraged, because in certain parts of the world, it's encouraged. It be, it's, it's like a, a state um, effort <laughs> in, in those surrounding nations, uh, the, the, the uh, Arabic nations that, that sit around and some of the Islamic nations that sit around Israel, uh, are committed to the destruction of Israel. And so as, as, as hatred of the Jews is tolerated, so hatred and targeting of other minorities comes in the wake of that. If you can get away with this, we can get away with that. <clears throat> and so the rise of conspiracy theories in America, the QAnon phenomenon, what the heck is that about? It's just crazy. Now, now it lurks in, on the internet and it lurks in kind of these quiet subterranean places. But people believe that nonsense. And so the rise of conspiracy theories and there is this, you know, so we, I, wanna, I don't want to say that anti-Semitism is the cause of our political polarization, but, but where we see... Uh, the Jews being targeted in increasing measure, it emboldens the demonizing of others. Okay, that's the idea. And I think we would all agree we see, we find ourselves in a time where there are 
others that are demonizing others. And so I, I think to some degree, this rise of this critical race theory may actually be a part of that whole, that whole thing that, that it is now, it's just a given it, it's almost a mainstream that to attack whiteness. Now, now, okay. Uh, I've got my own, uh, dismantling racism training uh, coming up again this week, and I'm going to reflect a little bit later in the week, uh, and perhaps into next week on that. But the the hatred of the other, I guess that's the point. This increasing, rather than seeing ourselves as the melting pot, uh, the United States as a melting pot. Uh, out of the e pluribus unum, out of many, one, it seems as if now we are not one, we are many. And we are to identify these various uh, groups, the identity politics, identity groups. And you are this person and you are that person based on the color of your skin or your gender uh, choice, etc. Um It seems to be some indicator of moral decline, if I could say it that way, and perhaps some intellectual decline and decay that people would actually believe some of these conspiracy theories. Um, I I could probably go, go further into this, but let me just say it this way. There are a number of political conspiracy theories on both sides of the aisle, okay? Republicans believe things and Democrats believe things that I just don't think are so. Now, some of you are going, yeah, but it is so. (laughs) And so whether it's the mainstream media conspiracy or steal the election conspiracy, you know, these kinds of things, the fact that some of you are listening to going, yeah, but I think those things really are true. That's my point. Now, is all of this connected to anti-Semitism? I, I don't know. But this, so I was intrigued by that language that Alan spoke of, Alan Ronkin spoke of on Sunday night, that anti-Semitism is a canary in the coal mine. It, it precedes other destructive phenomenon in a society. And so we certainly see on college campuses, in the halls of Congress, um, uh, our own Christian uh, Presbyterian denomination, the the boycott, divest, uh, sanction movement, the BDS movement, which is just now accepted by a lot of people as the way to go. So, So that's the piece I'm reflecting. I don't know what to do with it yet. I'm just trying to dig into it. What is this canary in the coal mine? I know the phrase and I know the idea, but that anti-Semitism would be a harbinger, an indicator, an early warning system. And if in fact, as we heard statistically, just the stats are indicating that anti-Semitism is on the rise in our own country and, and globally, but I think they were speaking of the United States, that if the concept is true, valid, that bodes ill for our society. And I look around at our society and I am concerned. Now, I believe God is greater, okay? So I'm not, I'm not a chick, I hope I'm not a chicken little and run for the hills. But it does appear that um, there are um, intellectual, philosophical, tribal movements at work in our society, tribalism, this us against them, me against you. Um, and and I, I'm paying attention to that. that I'll, I'll say it that way. Some of the other tension that I have been feeling or thinking uh, since Tuesday night, I'm sorry, since since today's Tuesday, since Sunday night, <clears throat> this, the reality of anti-Semitism is people opposing Abraham and Abraham's family, okay? It's kind of 
pulling it all the way back to the source. <clears throat> and I recall, uh, I, I know this, but I, 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 it came to mind yesterday, the Genesis chapter 12, <clears throat> when God calls Abram. He's known as Abram at first and then eventually Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The Abrahamic promise or the Abrahamic blessing. And so God calls Abram, Sarah, they can't have children. God says, don't worry, I'll take care of that. Isaac is born and the story goes from there. And so it's this notion of, I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and those who curse you, I will curse. Anti-Semitism is cursing Abraham. I would offer that. that. That's my reflection. I'm going, hmm. And so is this anti-Semitism a, a cursing of Abraham? And, and then what happens as a result of that? And I, I got to just thinking this morning already, uh, Nazi Germany, uh, could there be any worse situation than the, the Holocaust, the, the killing of six million Jews in the concentration camps, etc.? And, you know, Hitler certainly was destroyed. <clears throat> Germany was destroyed. It, it, that, that unleashed such destruction. But the whole world war, I mean, it was Hitler who really kind of brought that thing on, right? I mean, there, there were other forces at work, Mussolini, you know, there were other forces but it was Hitler's obsession with the Jews and killing the Jews. And I was trying to do some reading about that. Why did Hitler hate the Jews so much? There's an interesting, <clears throat> he was enamored of Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, the philosopher. And Nietzsche himself uh, was anti-Semitic. He despised the Jew Paul. Nietzsche did not like what Paul the Apostle but he called him the Jew Paul because Paul exalted the weakness of Jesus. Jesus dying on the cross, it was the Pauline image of, I declared to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And Nietzsche despised that. He thought it was strength and power, the ubermensch, right? The Superman. And so Hitler perhaps was influenced by some of this that actually viewing Paul and his teaching as responsible for the rise of Christianity, which exalts, in Nietzsche's mind, weakness rather than strength. And so Hitler becoming obsessed, there are probably other reasons why Hitler um, wanted to remove the Jews, but this idea that it was the Jews that gave rise to the Christ and Christianity, which exalts sacrifice um, and dying, laying down one's life as the noble feature rather than conquering others, it was Christ was conquered. So it's an interesting kind of ironic twist. So anyway, I've been fascinated doing some more reading on all of this. Uh, but I have been thinking, why, why is it our Psalms? You know, Psalm 80, you have made us a source of contention to our neighbors. Why do people hate the Jews? And so you've got this in our scriptures, there is this, this clear racial division, as it were, if we could say it that way, between the Jews and the Gentiles. God chooses Abraham, blesses Abraham, um, kind of hedges Abraham's family about with the Mosaic law, the ceremonial uh, law, uh, the, the, the dietary law, the, the laws against intermarriage, do not practice the customs of the surrounding nations. And so there's a clear Jew-Gentile division and God ordained that. And so I'm kind of sitting with this tension a little bit. So some of this is a result. I, I, I don't know that God ordained anti-Semitism. I, I, I don't 
want to go there. But it traces itself back. The kings of the earth and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And it was understood the anointed one, Israel understands itself collectively to be the anointed one, the blessed family. Which is maybe why they miss Messiah, Jesus Messiah, <clears throat> uh, as the, the anointed one. And so it's this idea, what, what I'm kind of wrestling with is we have this, our scriptures are very clear that there are these historic animosities and enmities between Jew and Gentile. It, in the New Testament, it shows up where Paul uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 is writing about how the cross of Jesus Christ breaks down that dividing wall of hostility. The, the, the court of the Gentiles, the Gentiles were walled off from in the temple. They could only go so far and only Abraham's people, only the Jews could come all the way into the temple. And so I think symbolically that dividing wall, Jew-Gentile is separated Jesus breaks that down so that in Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile. We are all one in Christ. And so what's interesting now is the church is essentially a Gentile church. And that happened pretty quickly. And, and so Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are exploring this. Paul's wrestling with why has this hardening come upon Israel uh, the Gentiles are coming in in droves, but it seems as if God's people, the Jews, are not. And so Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are wrestling with that, that the church of Jesus Christ is essentially a Gentile phenomenon. And, and to this day, it, it, it certainly remains predominantly a Gentile. That is, Abraham's blood does not flow in most Christian believers. Now, Paul also teaches that believers in Christ are Abraham's children by promise, not by blood, but by promise. And so we rightly understand ourselves to be heirs of the Abrahamic promise. But Paul talks about a hardening has come on Israel until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. And then, and then the idea is there will be a returning Israel, that is ethnic Israel, Abraham's blood family will return to Jesus as Messiah. And so we await that still. And so these are some of the tensions. And so there was a, a little piece of the, the, the presentation on Sunday night where um, Alan spoke about deicide, the, the accusation that the church makes that the Jews killed Jesus. I spoke to that a little bit yesterday. And then he cited a passage in Matthew where it says, his blood be upon us, uh, kind of the, the blood oath. And, and that historically Christians um, have pointed that out as a, a reason for attacking or persecuting Jews because you killed our Christ. That is a I completely reject that notion, the collective responsibility of the Jews. Again, I spoke to that yesterday. What's interesting is the, the, the challenge that the church faces, is it appropriate to evangelize Abraham's family? Is it appropriate to evangelize Jews? While I do not hold Alan Ronkin and Sue Stolov responsible for the death of Jesus Christ any more than I consider myself responsible for the death of Jesus, it was my sin that put him there. But we are to make disciples of all nations, and so there's, uh, there's some tension there. I would want all people, I would want... Uh, those who are practicing Buddhist. I would want those who are uh, Islamic, Muslims. I would want uh, atheists. I would want secularists. I would want scientists. I would want uh, poets. I want everybody to embrace Jesus. And that would include, include the family of Abraham. And, and so 
is evangelism, I don't know the answer to this question. This might be a follow-up with, with uh, Alan and Sue offline to, to think out loud with them. Is How would a Christian go about being in a respectful conversation and dialogue with uh, a Jew with regard to faith in Jesus? Uh, Alan did make reference to forced conversions, and there's that there are sad stories, you know, not just towards Jews but towards others, um, where this this kind of conquering mentality with the sword or with with coercion, people are made to be followers of Jesus. Well, there's that's not that's not gospel ministry, and so so that that's something that remains. Uh, I, I will continue to reflect on that. Um, but what, what is clear to me is a responsibility that we have to, we would always want to advocate on behalf of someone who is being, this is the, the, the image of the Good Samaritan, right? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Somebody is being wounded. Somebody has been attacked. We get off our horse. We get off our donkey. We, we try to care for that person regardless of the cultural boundary that may exist between. And I think that's why Jesus told that parable. The Samaritans were considered to be half-breeds and dogs by, sadly, by the Jews. So again, you know, there is a two-way street around some of this animosity and hostility. And so Jesus tells the story to kind of call out the priest and the Levite, and he, and he exalts, he makes the hero of the story somebody that would have culturally been an anti-hero. Uh, the Samaritan would have been the bad guy. And, and so the teaching of Jesus just radically upends the cultural customs and categories. And, and so... Uh, I believe we are called uh, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, and to love our enemies. And and so, if I were being attacked by someone, I would want somebody to stand up for me and advocate for me, whether they were part of my moral tribe or not. And so, as we find uh, others being attacked, uh, be it Jews. Uh, brown skin, be it racial or, or otherwise, then I think we have some responsibility to advocate on behalf of their humanity and their being image bearers of God. Now, the tension is, again, where there are realities in play, with, and I'm thinking perhaps of, of, of gender justice, gender minorities, those who would, you know, be part of the LGBTQ plus community, where I would understand that to be not a, 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 a life that is honoring to God and, and would teach that at the same time, could I stand with and should I stand with uh, those who may be being attacked and persecuted in some way? And so there's, there's, some, there's tension there that I want to continue to explore myself and, and with you all. So. But let me, let me wrap up here. The Abrahamic promise, I think, continues. Those who bless Abraham, and, and I think that as Christians, we bless Abraham. Father Abraham is our father. He is the father of, of the faithful. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And so that is the hallmark of Christian faith. We are saved not by our works, not by our genealogy or bloodline. We are saved by faith. We believe the promise of God that in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, forgiveness of sins is available. And by faith in his name, we find ourselves in a reconciled relationship with God. And we seek that for all people. So let me close here. Um, this probably leaves more questions open <laughs> than answered. But that's what I want to do, <laughs> to keep us wrestling and leaning into this. And so let's, let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for this new day. And pray that your mercies uh, afresh would, would greet us and meet us. And with those with whom we may differ and disagree on, on many matters, help us to be good neighbors to all we come across this day, those closest to us, those strangers, those we might find being attacked in some way. May we 
be as the Good Samaritan. May we be as Jesus, uh, standing and advocating on behalf of others. And so, Father, teach us to lay down our lives. Teach us to lay down our lives uh, as an expression of our faith in Jesus, who laid down his lives, not only for us, but for the whole world. And so we make our prayer now in his name, even as he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.